what are some different things we can do to lessen that um, risk for rumen acidosis as this and still get good rumen development. Welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Mike Ballou to the show from Texas Tech. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Can you give us a little bit of background, Mike, on your uh, history in the dairy industry and how, how you ended up where you are today? I try not to go too far back, but I guess I'll go back to when I grew up in the Central Valley of California. And uh, so I was born and raised in Visalia, Tulare area, and uh, everybody I knew was somehow involved in the dairy industry. And so my grandfather actually immigrated from the Netherlands and uh, drove a milk truck in Southern California. He actually immigrated to Minnesota for one year, but it was a really cold winter. And then they made it to Southern California. Bought cows up in the Central Valley. And that's kind of where uh, my mom and dad obviously moved. And I, I was raised in that area. So I kind of grew up around working on my grandfather's dairy. And then my dad was actually in the vitamin and mineral uh, premix business. And so that's kind of where my interest in nutrition uh, came from, but I was always interested in health too. I actually worked in an ER uh, when I was in high school and uh, it was pre-med when I first went to UC Davis, uh, but then switched uh, to animal science and then stayed there and got my PhD with Ed DePeters and worked with Kirk Clazing. Uh, some of you may know Kirk Clazing. Um, he's more of a poultry nutritional immunologist, but I learned a lot of my principles and philosophies working with both Ed and uh, Kirk. Um, and then uh, Moved out to Lubbock in 2007 after I finished my PhD. And actually, my brother had moved the year prior um, from California uh, and started a dairy out here in, in West Texas. And so he actually milked cows out here until about last year uh, when he sold his cows. And then he and I actually purchased that place, the facility from him, and are now raising uh, uh, basically a, a calf raising facility. So we're raising some beef on dairy crosses and uh, some heifer replacements for, for individuals. So um, I married a, a, a lady whose family dairies. And so I've, my whole life kind of revolves around the dairy industry. So we talk about cows quite a bit, but I also try to find friends that aren't tied to the dairy industry because I do like to get away from it. So, um, and, and talk about other things like sports. So our Yeast 40 is a natural biotechnology from ICC, designed to boost the health and productivity of animals under challenging production systems. Our Yeast 40 performance is supported by an unique processing technology that results in a pure product containing high levels of beta-glucans, MOS, and yeast metabolites. These factors, combined, promote the ruminal and intestinal modulation, helping the animals to reach their full potential. So you, you've got a lot of balls in the air, I know. Can, can you give us a little bit of a rundown on what some of your responsibilities are uh, at the university on top of the sort of business you're running as well? Yep. So um, I'm in the Department of Veterinary Sciences, which is a new department, fairly new department. It started in 2017. Uh, Texas Tech at that time was, was positioning itself to, to get a School of Veterinary Medicine. And the chancellor at the time said, what can we do? Uh, and they said, well, you can start a department of vet science. The dean kind of looked over at me. I was in the room. He's like, Mike, you kind of know a lot about animal health. He's like, why don't you go hire some people? And so I did. And so my faculty are now up to five. Um, and so we're not affiliated directly with the School of Veterinary Medicine. So Texas Tech did get that, that vet school. It's located in Amarillo, about uh, 100 miles north of Lubbock. Um, and so really kind of the role of my department is to serve as kind of a, a liaison or a connection, uh, especially for the research faculty at the vet school um, with the main campus here in Lubbock. So we do a lot of research collaborations. Um, I facilitate a lot. Uh, and actually two of my faculty are joint appointed uh, with the School of Veterinary Medicine. So they both have a 25% uh, research appointment with the School of Veterinary Medicine. Again, kind of trying to firm up that linkage between the vet school and, and the main campus down here in Lubbock. And then um, I obviously now am a small administrative role with only five faculty, so I'm back teaching. Um, and uh, we did just recently are in the final process of getting approval of uh, a master's degree in animal health and industry. Um, that really, it, it's it, it's really flexible. It can be completely uh, taken at a distance. 
Um, so uh, students can work full time. And so I see a lot of students using it as a gap between, uh, you know, undergraduate and then maybe going to vet school to, uh, you know, they can work full time, gain additional uh, experience working with other veterinarians, uh, but also complete a degree in uh, a master's degree. Uh, but we also see a lot of individuals that are just wanting to gain additional uh, education relative to how do you look at data and, you know, some of the more basic, you know, we teach immunology, immunopathology, uh, epidemiology, uh, animal diseases. And so again, they can just gain some additional um, coursework in, in classes focused specifically on animals. So are some of those people maybe five or 10 years into their career and, and trying to just step up in their training? Exactly. Exactly. So we wanted to also be able to target some of these people that are already working in industry, but, but want some additional uh, resources. Actually, I had been asked that probably about 10, 15 years ago. Somebody asked me, Mike, do you teach an online class in immunology? I'd really like to have, you know, X, Y, and Z take that class. And so that was in the kind of the back of my head when I was, um, coming up with this, this degree program and kind of putting it together. That's great. So <clears throat> I thought we could dig in a little bit today into your, your expertise in, in calves and especially sort of developing the gut and in the, in the immune system. <clears throat> what got you started focusing on calves a lot? I know you, you've got a lot of research background in that and you've got a business kind of in that space now. What, what got you focused there? You know, it's funny. Uh, the availability of animals uh, actually was the the first sure. thing. So, you know, I did my PhD at UC Davis. We had a herd of lactating cows, of about 100 cows. So as I was trying to design some experiments and thinking through some things, I was just, I did do a lactating cow study and it took a long time because it took forever to enroll those animals while I was there. Um, but honestly, it, it, some of it was just availability to animals. And I was really interested in a lot of things. I wanted to do quite a few studies. And so I kind of fell into that niche. And then, um, you know, and that was the early 2000s. There weren't, I mean, there were people working in that field, but uh, it was, it was kind of wide open a little bit. And then I was always interested in, in gut health. And so it was just a, a good animal model um, to, to study uh, gut health for, for a variety of reasons. And then, you know, UC Davis is pretty close to, to Hillmar Cheese there and where there was a lot of Jersey calves. So I ended up doing a lot of work with Jersey bull calves. And if uh, you know things about Jersey bull calves, it just opened up a lot of opportunities for me to, to really dig in and, and understand some basic, but also then kind of always apply it to, back to the animal. Cause that's, I always tell people, I like basic science and I like understanding why things work the way they do and trying to figure that out. But at the end of the day, with my connections to the dairy industry, you know, my father-in-law, my brother, you know, my grandfather, they really didn't care about a neutrophil and its function. So I always had to, you know, pull it back and, and round it back out to, to the whole animal and to even back to the population of animals. So you've been involved in that space for about 20 years now. Um, are there two or three things that 20 years ago we didn't know or didn't have a basis for driving towards this practice that, you know, really have changed during that time? It's, you know, it's funny. I'll, uh, there's a lot of, and I'm actually giving a talk at the Dairy Calf and Heifer Association meeting in Denver this year um, on post day one colostrum feeding. And it's funny, okay. I wrote a article and I can't remember if it was hordes of progressive dairymen while I was still in graduate school. And the whole premise behind the thing was all the other stuff that's in colostrum besides IgGs that are important to gut health. And, you know, we wrote that article, we've all known about some of those things. There was a little bit of research here and there. And now that field's kind of blown up in the last, I would say, couple of years um, because we've seen a lot of benefits to, to what I'll call post day one, feeding some levels of either transition milk or colostrum milk or colostrum um, added into the, the milk uh, program for the first couple of days or first weeks. There's a, there's a couple of different strategies uh, for that. Um, you know, also at that Dairy Calf and Heifer Association meeting, I'm going to talk about can we do some things to where it's not necessarily feeding uh, colostrum or transition milk, but almost mimic some of the benefits uh, by almost formulating uh, what I would consider more of a transition milk. I've been saying for years we need to look at uh, the milk feeding program or let's just say the calf and during the pre-weaning phase. We really need to look at it as, you know, at least two different distinct phases, that neonatal period. And I can classify that as the first seven, 14, 21 days. And, you know, 
let's just say it's the first 14 days and then the other period where we're starting to transition those calves trying to be start developing as a ruminant but you know that first 14 days really focused on gut health um like intestinal gut health um maybe some abomasal gut health is another area that we've we've been focused a lot on um and then as we start moving on we want to maintain that intestinal health but we also start got to start looking at how do we develop this rumen and develop a healthy rumen in this animal uh, because we know that we're going to wean it probably at about 60 days of age let's just say and it needs to be a functional rumen and we need to, to have a really healthy rumen. Um, especially, you know, now that 50% of, I mean, it's always been about 50% of the animals have been more terminal beef animals uh, in the dairy industry. It's just always been the Holstein steer. Now we're seeing it's primarily a shift towards these beef on dairy crosses. Um, and we know that early ruminal health has an important impact on the development of something like liver abscesses. And that could be a whole nother podcast, but you know, if we want to, we can touch on that a little bit. Cause we've been working in that space a little bit over the last, I would say two years with the, the USDA and a couple other collaborators here at Texas Tech. So let's start with, um, when, when do you really think there's meaningful rumen development beginning? Is it is it tied completely to when starter intake begins or is there kind of a, earliest time that you think that can happen? Yeah, I mean, I, so I think it starts happening early and I do think it is tied with uh, solid feed intake and primarily being non-structural carbohydrates. And let's just say starch and sugars are, are the main yep. things. And so um, that are going to start developing that rumen. Um, you know, I used to, to hypothesize, you know, if you I learned a lot about feedlots when I moved to Texas. <laughs> and sure. I, the funny thing is when I moved here, a lot of people, the position was really ruminant nutrition and health. Most people were thinking it was going to be a feedlot person. Um, quite a few people like my dairy background, but I, I've learned a lot of things from the, the feedlot industry and, and tried to apply them over to the, the dairy industry and vice versa. Um, but, you know, when they, they bring animals in and adapt them to a high starch diet, you know, they, they typically step them up on that because it allows the rumen communities. And that's what I always teach when I teach. And, and you probably do this too, is when you teach biochemistry, I always say it's amazing how biology will adapt if it's given time. And so that slow adaption, you know, stepping them up on three different rations to that, that high concentrate diet. And there's reasons why they do that. It allows the rumen microorganism communities to, to adapt where you don't have a huge lactic acid rumen drop in rumen pH and rumen acidosis rum, ruminitis and rumen lesions and, and things like that. And so I used to hypothesize that, you know, calf starter intake, they nibble a little bit, you know, they'll eat a little bit, 25 grams, you know, and then they'll eat 50 grams. And, and so it's, I was like, ah, they're probably slowly adapting and they're really not at a risk for, for rumen acidosis you know, when they're eating two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pounds of that calf starter, because they slowly kind of adapted up to it. But there's been some more recent research where coming out of the University of Wisconsin, some really nice data around 2020 um, that showed that no, in fact, the rumen pH is very low in this developing rumen. Um, because if you look at the composition of a calf starter, it looks like a finishing diet. Um, but I was wrong in terms of my hypothesis that it it wouldn't induce rumen acidosis. And in fact, I had gone back and we had done a study probably about 10 years ago uh, where we fed what I would have considered a very safe grower diet. It was fairly low starch, much more higher fermentable uh, fiber. Um, but it, I mean, it was fairly low, higher NDF diets, grower diets. And I looked back at, we had uh, put fistulas, rumen fistulas in those animals. I looked back at that PhD and I was like, wow, I was surprised how low the, the pHs were uh, in that study. And that, that was a fairly conservative grower diet. So, you know, back to your simple question, I rambled a bit and I, I do that a lot, but, um, you know, I think room and development starts occurring right away. Um, and we need to be very aware of what we're doing, you know, as those animals start eating a pound of starter, uh, because I do think we, we, we do have the propensity to maybe feed a, a diet that may induce some some rumen acidosis and so philosophically right now and, and this is an area that's act i'm actively researching is you know what are some different things we can do to lessen that um risk for rumen acidosis as this 
and still get good rumen development. Um, because if you get rumen acidosis, I mean, the rumen's going to develop, but you're also going to see a bunch of ruminitis and lesions there. Um, and the thing that that's really interesting to me is we've taken some, some animals off of what I would say, um, acidosis inducing calf starter rations. And then we put onto a really safe grower diet. And then we've harvested some of these animals and, and do rumen lesion scores and, and look at liver abscesses. Uh, but the thing that really is kind of imparted on me in the last two years is they had been on a safe diet for 60 days. And I still see a lot of rum, ruminitis in those, those huh. animals. So, you know, if I would have thought that, you know, that it would have turned over and it would have, uh, you know, that that rumen would have looked healthier after being on a fairly low, lower energy diet, uh, a safer diet for 60 days. So, again, I I'm just at the point now, I think we need to to really start early. We need to be thinking about it early from day one, really. So just thinking about that and thinking about kind of the natural scenario where, you know, I grew up on a cow calf operation and calves developed the rumen by nibbling on grass, right? But it's over the reamed at six or seven months, typically not two. What, what do you think is, is the, well, I guess, A, do you think in that scenario, they also have low pH maybe, or do you think it's grazing forage with soluble sugar instead of starch that's different? Or do you think it's the timing that's a big deal? I, I think you touched on, but I think you answered your question. I think it is the soluble sugars, the higher fiber, uh, you know, sugars are going to be less uh, rumen, uh, dropping the rumen pH. Um, they're nibbling on it. They're probably consuming more milk. So they're eating less starter too. Um, and so I, I think when we limit feed milk, especially we do, and, I, and I'm not opposed to it, but we also need to be much more attentive to um, the, the type of starter that we're feeding. Um, so, you know, looking at starter formulations, I'm looking at uses of whole grain. I do like including, um, some hay in there, not a lot, you know, less than 5%, typically more like 3% chopped. And I don't care about the quality of the, the hay, but just give it a little bit of a, a scratch. Um, you know, and then some fermentable, uh, fiber as well. So we, you know, down in this neck of the woods and, uh, out West, we feed a lot of cottonseed holes in starter rations. Mm -hmm. and they do really, really well. It looks, you look at the starter going, man, this just doesn't look like it's, it's going to develop a, but you know, it, it does. Um, and honestly, I, I used, I, I what's your, I, I hope the thing you're understanding from me is I proved myself wrong a lot because I used to see <laughs> some of these diets going, man, they're just leaving a lot of, uh, average daily gain on the table push starch, push starch. Let's get fermentable carbohydrates in there and let's get that rumen developed. And, you know, cause you look at some of the, the other data where they had looked at adding cotton seed holes, 5%, 10% cotton seed holes into these starter rations, average daily gain on a shrunk body weight was less, um, in, in those studies. But I've also seen, if you actually look at the, the data from Wisconsin that, that I referenced earlier, um, they fed a diet and, <clears throat> And one was a completely pelleted kind of uh, calf starter that probably a lot of people feed. And then the other one was a whole corn, uh, about 10% cottonseed holes, and, uh, and then a pellet with some molasses. The calves on the uh, whole co or the, the cottonseed holes and whole corn gained a lot better. And when they looked at the rumen pH, the, the completely pelleted, rumen pH was really, really low. And I think it was just, they were acidotic. It threw them off. Their intakes were a lot lower too. And actually the ones on the cottonseed holes, if you looked at the grams or the pounds of, um, starch that was consumed, they were consuming more starch because they were consuming more and those animals ended up gaining more and the, the rumen was healthier. And so, you know, I'm, I'm back to like, okay, maybe I'm not leaving a bunch on the table in terms of average daily gain. If I focus on developing a healthy rumen. Um, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm at on some of that, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you let that rumen develop over six months, like a cow calf, like you said, um, before you completely wean them off milk, I mean, it's just a slower transition and it just goes back to biology. It just allows that transition to take place slower. So knowing that, so I, I'm not necessarily, I always say it's good to understand the problem 
that doesn't mean necessarily I want to go back to mother nature because that's just not going to be profitable for the dairy industry to, to raise calves like that. Um, right. So what can we do to, and that's basically how I've made my career is like, okay, here's the problem. Let's see if we can find a solution um, and not reinvent the wheel. And so that's kind of where I'm at with, with like starter formula, starter growth ration formulation right now is maybe not be so aggressive. Um, and, you know, everybody always, people will look at my calf starter rations that I formulate and it's whole corn and everybody always looks at it and they always say, well, they, they, a lot of that's going to go out the back end. And I said, no, actually it doesn't. I mean, at some point, if you feed whole corn, like through the grower ration at, and these calves are like 300 pounds. Yeah. You'll start seeing fecal starch go up, but you know, we monitor fecal starch in the hutch and even up to like a hundred days. And we don't really see any increase in fecal starch. Um, so they are getting all that starch out of there and it's probably just getting digested a little bit slower and it's not hitting the room and they yep. just, and cause I do worry about slug feeding too, um, of, um, starter as well. So this is probably a really ignorant question, but yeah, one thing I was thinking about, as you talked about the acidosis in those calves is you don't have the salivary buffer secretion that we, you know, rely on in a mature ruminant. Do you think that's part of the story with feeding whole corn is actually starting to get rumination going yeah, and some more? Yeah, definitely could be because I, you know, and it's funny and I, I'm going to, I shouldn't even say this because I, I don't know it well enough, but I've heard a lot of people say, well, you just have to add a little bicarb to your, your calf starter. It's interesting. I don't think adding bicarb from my understanding, like in the feedlot industry, it doesn't work. So, um, Cause it's, it's sodium bicarbonate still a fairly, and you just can't get enough in there to do it. Uh, right. But yep. if you can stimulate, stimulate, uh, salivary, then yeah, I, th I mean, you start generating lots of, of bicarb that way and, and it may help that way. So yeah, I mean, the whole corn may, may help with that as well. Cause you do see him chewing on that a little bit more. Yep. So let's dig in a little bit more on the um, liver abscess thing. For one, maybe some people listening aren't familiar with that as a pretty hot topic in the dairy on beef space and Texas Tech has been the hub for all that. So if you can give us some background and then what are you looking at now for possible solutions? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I wish I had listened to the feedlot guys like 10 years ago when they were telling me, hey, Mike, this is gonna, <laughs> this is gonna be something, this is important. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> again, I, I didn't heed some sage advice from some, some uh, feedlot nutritionists, you know, so liver abscess has been around for a while and it's always, in, it's been in more prevalent in Holstein steers than it was in native beef uh, for whatever reason. And ever, a lot of people had a lot of different, um, you know, theories or hypotheses uh, on why that was, you know, whether or not it's these animals are more days on feed and, um, stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, we were hoping maybe that when we started doing some beef on dairy, that maybe if there was a genetic component to that, that we'd read out some of that it's, I mean, I'm just going to say that it's probably about equal between Holstein, uh, steers and these beef on dairy crosses. Uh, for whatever reasons. And again, like I said, everybody's got their kind of philosophies. I have mine, other people will disagree with mine. Um, and, um, but the, the, the main reason it's an issue, you know, it, it does decrease the, the value. You can't sell the liver, but again, that's a small portion of the, the value of that carcass. Um, you know, the, the bigger issue is actually in the, the packing house in the sense that if the liver has a liver abscess, it gets pulled off the rail, goes to this other, so it can get cut out. And so you'll end up having to trim it out. And if there's some adhesions, um, you know, it there's some more trimming. So you do lose some red meat yield that way. But again, that's even less of a concern. It really is just the time that it takes to pull it off the rail. And if you're running liver abscess um, prevalence or incidence of, you know, 25 to 50%, on these beef on dairy crosses versus let's say five to 10% on native beef, you know, the, the packing house, they're going to start discounting carcasses. It's less of an issue right now just because they're tied on inventory. So they'll take whatever. So they're complaining less. I shouldn't say that probably, but, um, but it will be, it's going to, so you're hearing about it less again, but as soon as inventories become more tight and they can discount carcasses, 
for having liver abscesses, you're going to start seeing that to the point that where, you know, there's been conversations, well, we're just going to discount every beef on dairy carcass or every Holstein steer, you know, $30 a head just because, you know, the, the increased incidence. You know, what's causing the liver abscess, you know, for a long time, it, you, you typically find this bacteria called Fusobacterium necroforum in the abscess. So it's an anaerobic bacteria. It's in the room and it's in the lower gut um, of animals, but typically it's, you don't find it in peripheral circulation. And it seems to be that it somehow gains access into the body, makes its way to the liver, like most things do. And it ends up causing like an abscess there. And so, um, and so a lot of the, the thought process, and we've actually developed a couple uh, research models with the USDA livestock issues research unit. And just kind of, I would say just North of the Lubbock airport They're they're doing a lot of the work and I'm collaborating on a lot of it, but, um, and we actually just picked up some calves again last week to, to do another rep on it, but we basically do a, uh, acidosis challenge on these animals. So we kind of pulse acidosis challenge, and then we challenge them with fusobacterium and we're able to get liver abscesses and depending on the, the replicate, anywhere from 40 to 75% of the animals will develop uh, rumen acidosis. So now we're starting to look at some interventions, um, you know, some strategies to, to, to reduce that. Um, and so again, rumen health, I think everybody would agree that rumen health and maybe even intestinal health play a role in helping prevent uh, rumen acidosis. So, you know, back to, your earlier comment of, you know, cow calf versus, you know, Holstein steer or beef on dairy calf in a calf raising facility from day one on milk replacer gets weaned at 60 days. It's very different. You know, is that contributing to it? Um, you know, I'm not sure, but um, I, I tend to think that we have a responsibility to look at it. And there, there's a, there's a chance that the way we raise calves is increasing that incidence of, I used to always get annoyed because everybody down the food chain would point the finger back down to the calf ranch. I'm like, well, we don't really know that. But the more I'm looking at, at these things, I, I was like, I think everybody has a, a role to play in it. Um, I think you can take a, an animal and put it in a feedlot and cause liver abscesses as well. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of data to show that. Um, but I also think there's some things we can do too, because I, I think you can can get some liver abscesses or at least set the stage that liver abscesses can develop. And again, I don't know where it's at, but I, I mentioned that I had seen some animals that had been on a fairly safe grower diet for two months. And when we harvested those animals, the rumen, I was still like, wow, I would be, be nervous to have a bunch of fuso there because uh, you can see directly how it gets through the, the rumen epithelium into the bloodstream. Um, so, you know, I'm not, needless to say, you know, I think there are things we, we can uh, try to do to improve rumen health. When you challenge those animals uh, in your model that you're giving oral fuso, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And we've done some stuff, oral fuso, oral fuso plus um, salmonella. Um, is try to get some insults on the lower gut because um, you'll see salmonella present a lot in, in some of those abscesses as well. Um, but honestly, we've also done some stuff where it's just few so alone and just ballparking. We, we get fairly similar incidences if we just use few so alone. So I think that's probably the, still the main driver. Um, but there's a, again, like any bacteria, there's different virulence factors that play, you know, not all few so should be considered the same. There are fusobacterium that are more, I'm going to say, uh, liver abscess prone uh, versus other. Because fusos, I mean, you'll you'll find fuso everywhere, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, that fusobacterium is is going to be uh, virulent enough to cause liver abscesses. Maximize profitability and herd health with early detection in animal health, reproduction, calving, and feeding. The most advanced bolus technology and professional support from agricultural experts makes this possible. Smax Tech, the health system that future proofs your operation. It's time for our famous three. Typical fresh cow incidence of clinical hypocalcemia is three to six percent while subclinical hypocalcemia affects 50% or more mature cows. 
Based on cutting edge research, Exelete offers a new approach that is build effective and the ZDUs. For more information, visit www.protecta.com. Great conversation, Mike. Okay, well, we've got three questions we've got to squeeze in here. So yep. I'm, I'm excited to hear what your answers are. So first one we throw at everybody, what's your favorite dairy-related book or resource that you turn to? It's funny. That, that's a good question. You know, I, I'm going to be boring with my answer on this one is I, I do open up the old NRC the, or the, the newer NASM book more often than probably any resource um, outside of just scientific literature. But, you know, I, I still go back to that quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, that, I know that's a boring answer, but. Yeah, it's a <laughs> consensus document of some of the best people in our field, right? Well, why wouldn't you use it? All right, what's your favorite book or resource outside of ag? Yeah, so this is a, I would say one of the, so I studied stress for a while and one of the books that really kind of changed the way I looked about stress in animals and, and just animal like handling uh, was actually a Stanford professor, Robert Sapolsky. And the book was Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And, it's, and honestly, I like the way he thinks about science. I like the way he explains science. And so I try to actually teach more like, like I enjoyed reading his book and I say, anybody can pick up that book, even if you're not in sciences and you'll understand science and appreciate it. So, you know, I, I model a lot of my teaching philosophy off of the way he uh, wrote that book. And I just think it's a good book. And it also helps me the way I look at animals and, and uh, you know, understand what stresses them and the, the impacts of stress has on animal health and performance and just overall well-being. Yeah, helps you think more creatively if you think outside of one species, probably. Right. Yeah. Okay, last question. In your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are not so successful? It's an easy one for me. It's, it's, I always say I want people that want to learn and work hard over just naturally gifted uh, smart. So work hard and just uh, ability to learn and, and adapt to, to new things good answer. Very good. Well, Dr. Mike Ballou, thank you so much for being part of the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me and enjoyed getting to talk with you, Barry. This has been another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit the like button and we will see you next time.